So let's take a step back because most people, including many in the financial markets, are scared by bonds. Like they just don't quite understand it. Do you have a price? Do you have a yield? Because <laughs> they move in opposite directions. There's this weird interest rate math as well. But they are also the domain of retirees. So they're not supposed to be that exciting, but yeah. they're very they're, they're very vague. They're very hard to figure out. Briefly explain, explain the concept behind bonds and why it's really straightforward even when you have different things like maturities and term structures. Absolutely. So I think that complexity just arises from the fact that you have all these different companies issuing all these different bonds of different kind of tenure and maturity and yield and so on, as you mentioned. So it's not really complexity that actually adds a ton of like layers. It's just different numbers. So basically, the bond market is just companies issue bonds, investors buy those bonds, and then they collect coupon payments for the duration of that bond. And that means, you know, the company's just going to pay them and pay them and pay them. And then at the end, it's all it's all kind of over. The coupon is the interest that people collect That's for lending exactly them right. money. That's exactly right. And it's really high if the company is really risky and it's really low if the company is perceived to not be really risky. And, you know, this is the kind of world that Bill Gross stepped into. This is the this used to be you would have these bonds and you would put them in the vault underneath your, you know, very sleepy insurance company. And you'd be like, OK, good. You know, we're, we're going to match this against the insurance policies that we have. And we'll be able to pay it out. We have these reliable coupons that come in and very predictable time. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of sleepy old world that retirees also function on, right? This is this is a very this is what's called fixed income. This is right. what they, very they rely dependable on. stream yeah. of revenue that come in if you're a retiree. Exactly. So Bill Gross steps into this world, this sleepy world. What does he do that is so revolutionary that like breaks the bond market essentially? Yeah, breaks it wide open. So the thing that, that Bill Gross did, and, and there are a couple other people with him that, that made this kind of happen, but they started trading bonds. So inflation was really high, and it was eating away at the value of these bonds as they sat in the vaults. And Bill Gross and a couple other people were like, wait, why are we not trying to change what we're holding? You know, if this bond is just sitting in the basement and, and losing value by the day, why don't we try to sell that bond and buy a new different bond, a better bond? Treat it like a stock almost. Basically, yes. So that's, you know, that's in service of price appreciation. So you can get both the interest payments and the price appreciation. And this was a revolutionary concept in the bond world. And it's really changed the entire shape of the market and, and turned it into this, you know, the very exciting and I think very exciting and complicated world that we know and love today. And Bill Gross had this incredible run where he, his fund was outperforming his benchmark, when whatever he measured himself against, yeah. and all these other funds as well, for years at a time. I mean, there, I go back to what James Carvel said about how if he wanted to be reincarnated, he would come back as a bond market. So it was like, you know, really powerful, and he was anointed the, the bond king. What exactly did he do as bond king, as a guy who traded these different bonds that made him so much money and made him so intimidating to people like James Carvel? So there's an enormous amount of influence, right? If you depend on someone else buying your debt, if they're like, mm, I don't like what you're doing, actually. I think you have too much debt. I think your new project's not great. I think this is not working. You know, they actually have a lot of say, and they can mm. write this these opinions, basically, into those loan and bond documents. You can say, I need you to keep your, you know, these ratios at this certain level, various things like that. And, you know, to the extent that that's applicable to the U.S. government, mm, but there is a, you know, there is a way that, Bill Gross and others were able to kind of loudly say, I don't approve of the way the government's doing this, this, or that. And that's effective. They basically do have to listen because there's there's an enormous market and they do rely on those, those prices. And so he managed to shift a lot of government policy as well. Uh, you write about how uh, there was a situation with Mexico and Bill Gross had a certain position and he wanted something to happen and he kind of went on TV, talked to reporters and actually managed to get the government to do what he wanted to do. So the Mexico situation was basically the investor base that typically bought Mexican bonds they got freaked out and they were very scared and, and pulled their money from the country. And the auctions, the, the country's auctions kept failing, mm -hmm. auction after auction. And that's pretty scary if you can't fund yourself, especially as a government. And they ended up, PIMCO saw that there was like a really, really good opportunity. There was, there was kind of noise that maybe there would be some kind of bailout coming, some kind of international relief, but it wasn't, it wasn't clear yet. And so PIMCO was like, well, why don't we just do it and kind of get ahead of it? Why don't we just pick up these 20% yields that you're never going to see again on this extremely short-dated bond and just kind of hope for the best? So we're going to buy when no one else is buying because exactly. we think that the government will come in and backstop all of this. That basically there would be international help, yeah, backstopping the government. And so they entered the auction, bought a ton of, the, of this Mexican debt, 
and they ended up basically s making it a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Mm. Because there was this bit of confidence. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, the auction did, did great. Oh my gosh, they filled the, the orders. And so everyone actually thought that it was the treasury, but it was PIMCO. And they were big enough, they were influential enough, and that's why people call Bill Gross the Bond King. That's right. Or at least at, at the height of his success. Right. I interviewed Bill Gross, the successful investor, but I didn't really know Bill Gross the man. You got an inside look at Bill Gross the man. You talked yeah. with him for hours for this book. Um, you reveal him to be hyper-competitive, yes. um, hyper-paranoid, and hyper-insecure as well. Are these qualities that enabled him to stay so influential for so long? Oh, that's such a great question. I think so. I think his dedication to whatever the competition is, is kind of unparalleled. And yes, that is exactly what makes him, you know, the Bond King and made him a billionaire and made him so great. That, you know, there's there's kind of a, a parallel in his gambling days. He was a, a blackjack, you know, he counted cards mm. in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And he learned that he, if he took a break, he might, you know, lose sight, he would lose focus, and it wasn't helpful to him. So he just stood there for hours for like, 15 hours He didn't time. take breaks. He just would not take breaks. So to me, like, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go get a snack. I'm going to get some water. But I'm normal. <laughs> and, like, there's, that's a big difference. And I think, you know, if you're just going to stand there and outlast everybody else, and that was his stated mission. You know, you're going to win in the end. Everyone else will fall away. Everyone else will go get a snack or quit or retire. And he just never would do that. Which is how he managed to stay ahead of the pack as well, even though there are plenty of other people who were doing the same thing he was doing. They were also trading bonds like stocks. Absolutely. And, and taking advantage of all these different pricing inefficiencies that he spotted in the market too. True. And I think, you know, he did spot things above and beyond people to some extent as well. Mm -hmm. But also they were probably going home at 6 p.m. And I don't think Bill stopped working at 6 p.m. You know, there's, there's a, a difference. If you just keep pressing for that extra basis point, mm -hmm. every single thing that you own, you're just looking at it, constantly examining it, you know, you can convert work into, <laughs> into more money. So I think that was, he just was unwilling to, to let something lie. Okay, so it's a, his, his, his obsession and his firm profited, and of course, he was the co-founder of his firm, PIMCO, so he profited as well. However, at some point, things turned south, especially when they were looking for a successor to him. They were trying to build up, you know, who else in the company might be able to take over from him one day. Yes. Uh, they hired Mohammed El Aryan, who is a noted international economist and very well spoken, uh, very uh, knowledgeable on global economics. He was supposed to come in and be kind of the adult in the room who would, who would steer the ship correctly after Bill Gross um, perhaps started to step away. Is that right? Yeah, that was exactly the idea. And there were a bunch of kind of flaws in this plan. Um, PIMCO had this big thing about how they would never have someone sharing the CEO and CIO role, that mm -hmm. conflating those roles they thought was really dangerous. And I think they view the Mohammed Alarian situation as kind of a proof of that theory, because mm -hmm. um, it, it didn't do what they wanted. It didn't really go well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also an argument that like the Bill and Muhammad personality type was just oil and water and that they were never going to actually get along. You know, Bill's very, I think this is it, you know, he's, he's driving forward in this direction and you can come with him or not. Muhammad's more consensus in Bill's view. You know, he thinks that he comes from this IMF bureaucratic world that's like so different from the bond world where mm -hmm. you have to make a fast decision and you have to have a strong opinion. Um, and so those kind of jarring views, that juxtaposition, I think may have doomed their relationship from the start. You know, it's hard to say because, of course, it, it worked out pretty terribly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think they had a lot of high hopes when he came in. You know, he's very well respected. He had some great trades when, in his first stint at PIMCO. And he seemed to be this kind of very hyper polite, like he's the most polite person you will ever meet in your entire existence. And there's this, you know, polished him that I think they thought would, would really help shepherd the firm forward. So they didn't get along, and that relationship deteriorated, but they did find other people. Douglas Hodge became the CEO of PIMCO, and people might remember Douglas Hodge as one of the people who got caught up in Operation Varsity Blues, yeah. paid a lot of money to Rick Singer to get his kids into elite schools, and yeah. I think he pleaded guilty, or he served time? Yes, okay. uh, he got one of the longest sentences, at least uh, to that point, yeah. Okay, so that, that didn't end well for Doug Hodge, but um, you talked to all kinds of people at PIMCO, you talked to Bill Gross, you talked to, or you tried to talk to Mohammed El Arian. Why did everyone keep talking to you? I'm curious, because you were kind of saying, let's pull back the curtain on this firm that has pretty much been very secretive, was very influential, but not a lot of people knew anything about it beyond the fact that it was a bond fund firm mm -hmm. based in Newport Beach, California, which was already kind of weird because, you know, bond funds and Wall Street people are in New York. Right, absolutely. I think, you know, that insularity, the fact that they were so far away, helped to keep it kind of, yeah, under wraps. 
Um, I spent a lot of time in Newport Beach and, and LA, obviously, but I think people talked to me because it was like too late by the time I was working on this book. I knew too much. Mm -hmm. You know, while I was here at Bloomberg News, I did a whole bunch of stories about it. You know, I covered PIMCO full time while this kind of explosion was happening. And it, it was the case that, you know, I already had, once you have one little scrap of information, if you're like, I heard this, is this right? And people are like, oh God, I don't want to talk to her, but that's like 80% right. And yeah. I don't want to see it in print 80% right. I want to see it 100%. So, and also a lot of these people don't want to be misrepresented, right? You know, they, this is their experience. This is their life. This matters to them. This is yeah. their reputation. So they want to have the opportunity to say, you know, that's not to say that everyone spoke to me for sure, but, um, but I, I definitely tried and everyone had the opportunity to fact check. And it is kind of like, you know, you want to, to know what the other parties are saying about you. I couldn't disclose any of that, so that was actually really awkward and kind of difficult. But they they know to some extent, they were there, they were in the room. They're like, I know this person's gonna say something mean about me. I wanna stand up for myself. Right, right. Okay, so your book also chronicles what happens uh, once Bill Gross is kind of left on his own. He is increasingly isolated from the rest of his firm and they negotiate what he thinks is um, a farewell but except he decides that he's going to preemptively quit and go to another fund, uh, Janice, so that he has the upper hand. At the end of the day, when you look back at this, when you, when you have readers who are not familiar with the intricacies of the bond market and the last 20 years in financial markets, what do you think is the lesson of Will Gross's career to everyone? Oh, wow. There are so many different ways to go with this because there's like the personal and the kind of anecdotal emotional, and then there's the professional. I do think you're seeing from a professional perspective, a lot of founders struggle with succession, right? This is kind of a classic story where, you know, you get to these heights by being hyper competitive and a little controlling, a little micromanagey, a little bit of a perfectionist. And so that makes stepping down nearly impossible, mm. right? And mm -hmm. picking another human being to shepherd your baby, like that's a whole, that's very difficult. And it, it, I think it requires a lot of like careful thought and strategy. Yeah. Obviously this is kind of a test case as to what not to do. Um, from the personal, I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, Bill's really self-aware, right? He's a psychology major from college. He thinks a lot about himself and his place in the world, and he mm -hmm. thinks a lot about why people act the way they do. So much of financial markets are psychology. But at the same time, there's kind of a limit to how self-aware you can be, right? So he, I think you see a bunch of instances over the course of this book where he knows better and does it anyway. And I can't account for that. I don't know what was going exactly through his head in those moments. And sometimes it feels like he doesn't either. Mm -hmm. But, and like, that feels familiar, who among us. But I think there's a, there's something interesting in that where you're supposed to bring this professional polish to a job like that, and you're still a person. So that friction, that, that in the end, I think was one of the things that really undid those relationships and forced him out of the company where he just kind of couldn't put down the personal.